Good morning. So normally I say I'm shocked and all that because my students aren't awake. I've got master's students this semester. They're awake. <laughs> so we're starting a series on the churches in Revelation. So we're going to go through the seven churches um, one at a time and look at what there is to learn from the seven churches that they were written literally to seven churches. But they're in the Bible for a reason. God didn't just sort of say, oh, I've got these things that I need to talk to these churches about because there were hundreds of letters sent to churches in those time periods and we've got 20 odd in the Bible. So these are obviously important letters. And the comment is made that it's sent to the seven churches in Asia. Now there were dozens, if not hundreds of churches in Asia at the time. Um, so seven is obviously kind of important here. And this is Revelation. Seven creeps up over and over and over again. This is an important number in Revelation. This is traditionally the number of completion. So here is a message that God has to his church as a whole. This is a summary of the key things he wants the church to know through the ages. And the catchphrase for every letter to these churches is, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So please, let us have an ear. So can we turn to Revelation chapter 1? So starting reading from verse 4. <clears throat> John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. Even those who pierce him in all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And then jump down to verse 10. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun, shining in full strength. And then to verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So to introduce this, Jesus himself introduces it in quite a dramatic, symbolic fashion. John sees this vision of Jesus walking around amongst a bunch of candlesticks or lamps. So we've got the lampstands. Okay, obviously, we were told 
Those lampstands are the churches. We are the light of the world. There is a reason why that symbolism is used, that Jesus is emphasizing and will emphasize later that we are the light of the world. We are to be displaying his light as we can in this world. We have the robe and sash. This is emphasizing that Jesus is our high priest. He's walking amongst the lampstands. He is there with us in his role as our high priest, in his role as protector and guider for the church. White hair. So, not so much in Western cultures, more so in Eastern cultures, white hair is a symbol of wisdom. As you age, you're supposed to get wiser. We hope we do. <clears throat> so we get wiser. White hair, like wool, like snow, pure white. And ah, pure white. What also is white a symbol of in the Bible? Purity. So Jesus, both our wise and pure protector, who is there leading us, who has all wisdom available for us. Eyes like fire. Penetrating, piercing, seeing to the truth of the matter. And fire is also associated with purity and purifying. He not only sees, but he sees what needs to be fixed, what needs to be changed, how we need to purify and convicts us for our opportunity to purify ourselves. Feet, like bronze refined in a furnace. Okay, some symbolism ages. Bronze. Oh, bronze. Refined in a furnace, tested, again, pure. Refined in a furnace, impurities have been removed. But it's his feet. It's refined and tested. And the result of the test is he is victorious. He has withstood the test. He lived here on earth a perfect life. He died and rose again victorious. That we have victory through him. And again, feet, a symbol of feet is as the conqueror. And these are feet of bronze, pure, hard, and tested. A voice, like the roar of many waters, overpowering. Um, don't typically see that often in Australia, but now I've been to Niagara Falls. Hundreds of meters from the fall, you have to shout at the top of your voice to be heard. The roar of many waters is overpowering. His voice carries through. Nothing can stop his voice. Nothing can stop his word. It has all power. <clears throat> and out of his mouth is a two-edged sharp sword. And we've already had the sword as a symbol in the scripture as dividing right from wrong, truth from heresy. So again, we have the sword discerning that our Jesus, who is protecting the church, who is our source of wisdom, has the discernment to help us see what is true and what is false. We can rely on him to show us the truth. 
the seven stars in his right hand. So again, we're told, okay, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. In his right hand, well, that's the hand of authority. That the seven stars who are there protecting the churches are under the authority of Jesus directly. The seven angels are under his control and command. And we've also had the picture in the Bible of we are in Jesus' hand, we are in God's hand, and nothing can pluck us out of his hand. It's security. Not only is there authority there, there is security there. He has the authority which provides us with security. And a face like the sun, blazing bright light which you can't even look upon, which illuminates our way. <clears throat> Again, we're told in the Bible, light, symbol of truth, symbol of guidance, that God's word is a light unto our path. And Jesus is the word. He is our light, our guide, and our way to the truth. And like the sun, it's bright, so we can reflect it. That light is there not just for our benefit, but for us to reflect to the world around us. So, John's description of Jesus, rather different to the one and only description we have of Jesus himself in his personal appearance on earth, which was Isaiah 53, verse 2. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. That when he was here on earth, God purposely chose he would be nondescript. The message was the word and the truth. People weren't attracted to Jesus because he was some idolic figure. He was just an ordinary guy that no one would be attracted to <clears throat> aside from the words that he said. Now we're shown a picture of Jesus as the conquering Lord. And Isaiah again, verse 52, or chapter 52, verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. This is our God who is bringing good news. Okay, so we have letters. They follow a format. And people have tried to make it a seven-part format because, gee, seven's a nice magic number, um, which I can sort of see, but I'm not going to go with seven. Okay, there is an introduction. Each letter has a different introduction. Jesus introduces himself differently to each church. Each introduction harks back to what John wrote about in chapter 1 and John's description of Jesus. It's a part of that description, but it focuses on the part that is most relevant to that church at that time. That each characteristic that John highlighted in chapter 1 is an important characteristic for us to know about our God in his relationship to us, his church. Each letter talks about what God knows about. It describes his knowledge of, I know these things about your situation. It demonstrates that Jesus is not isolated in heaven and unaware of us, or not concerned. He is walking amongst the lampstands. He is involved in our church lives. He is here with us. He's involved. He knows. 
which leads to a message. He knows what is happening, the good and the bad. And he has something to say for every church. Every church has something to learn from Jesus' message. There are things that need to be done. There are things that need to be changed. There's things that need to be prepared for in each letter. And there are consequences. There is what will happen. There's what will happen if you're disobedient. There is a warning. If you do not do this, this will happen. If you're disobedient, if you do not change, this disaster will fall upon you. And there's also comments about obedience, that if you're obedient, this will happen, which isn't always pleasant. It's not a nice, oh, if you're obedient, the blessing will be. Smyrna Inn is an example of, you are faithful. And because you're faithful, you will be persecuted. But there is a promise. There is a consequence which may be unpleasant even in the good side of things. But there's always a promise of the final outcome, the final blessing, the final result. That in the short term, something bad may or may not happen. In the long term, as my children, you will receive this blessing. So we have this message for us. Each church gets a different message because it was probably something literally a problem or an issue to be dealt with each church at that time. But each of those things are things that have happened in churches ever since that each of these letters are relevant to us today, both as a church and individually, because they are things that happen in churches and to us every day or throughout time. So these letters summarize things that are problems in churches. They summarize things that we have to deal with, troubles and trials and temptations that need to be overcome. They provide challenges for each of those temptations and trials and troubles and exhortations and promises. Things to be done, things that we can rely on for all of us for all time. So, let's move on to the first letter. So can you turn to Revelation chapter 2? So before I, when I first started writing this, I was going to ask you all to turn to the second book of Ephesians. But then I had all the preliminary stuff. So verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring, pa enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Oh, side note, picture. Library of Celsus in Ephesus. Ah, this was written, this was built after Revelation was <clears throat> written. Probably held a copy of Revelation and a number of other Christian literature. There was a fairly significant influence of the church in Ephesus by that time. <clears throat> okay, our introduction. God demonstrates his authority. The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. His message to this church is, I am the one of authority. I am there with you and I know your work. Intimately and in detail, I'm involved in your work. The start of that, the words of him, in Greek, it's literally, these things say the one. It's only used eight times in the New Testament. <clears throat> Seven of those are to the churches. This is kind of important. In the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, it's used extensively when introducing prophecy. When someone is making a prophetic utterance in the Septuagint, it would start with this standard frame. These things says the one. About 320 of those times, it is the one is God who is saying these things. John would be very familiar with that format. He picked this format very purposely. Here is a prophetic statement from God for each church. Listen carefully. Then we get the acknowledgement. I am there with you. I know your work. Okay. Their work. He knows their works. He praises them for their work. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, <clears throat> Luke writes, quoting Paul, <clears throat> in all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said it is more blessed to give than to receive. Paul was in Ephesus for about three years. <clears throat> he worked hard there. And <clears throat> just previously in Acts, he had literally said, I worked hard with you and for you. And you saw my example. You need to replicate that. And they did. <clears throat> God praises them for their works and the fact that they are not growing weary in their work. They are working hard. They are working for God. He praises them for their endurance. Paul would have seen them about 35 years previously. He probably wrote to them about 30 years previously. And in both cases, he exhorted them to work. And they are, and they have been. 30, 35 years? That's a couple of generations. It's not just the people who heard Paul. It's the next generation as well. He praises them for their doctrine, for their knowledge of the Bible and truth. Again, in Acts 20, verse 28, Paul warns them, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. 
and from among your own selves will rise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be alert, remembering that for three years I did not cease night or day to admonish everyone with tears. I took his warnings to heart. Paul also writes to Timothy, who was serving in the church in Ephesus, and encourages Timothy to teach them the truth and to teach them to watch out for false teaching and warns them of false teaching. They took that to heart again. Decades later, they are still seeking the truth, checking the message, and ensuring it is God's word. And if someone speaks that wasn't following the word, they were found out and pointed out. If we stopped here, this would sound like a glowing, wonderful church. People are active. People are doing works. We can see the activity of the church. We hear the Bible teaching. It's true, it's solid, it's good teaching. That sounds good. And he particularly points out the Nicolaitans. So false teaching was a problem in Ephesus, that it came up over and over again, something the church dealt with, but dealt with successfully because it gets repeated twice in just this short passage. Um, the Nicolaitans themselves, probably Gnostics. There's a vast amount of literature written about them. <clears throat> Most of it seems to be speculative. Um, but they were probably Gnostics, probably sensualists, probably those who said, God's grace is good for everything. Do what you want. Sin, God will forgive. The more you sin, the more God can provide his grace to you. They dealt with that. And God pointing that out, I can see as being something that, yes, he would particularly hate those who twist his meaning of grace to mean that you can sin freely would be something God would hate. And the church hated it. And there's no qualification on this praise. There's nothing that ends off with the, you're working, but you're sort of trailing off. You're working, but you're getting complaining and moaning about it. No, it's you're working and you're not weary. They were doing things for God. God acknowledges that. They were enduring the problems and sufferings they were going through. The church may have had a significant influence in Ephesus, but it was also the home of the emperor cults for Rome and the home of Diana's cult, that there were really major oppositions to the church in Ephesus as well, and they endured. Their doctrine was good, their teaching was good, they understood the truth. But there was one problem, one big problem. Life in the early church in Ephesus would have been exciting. Acts 19 recounts what happened when Paul was there. Verse 11 says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so even the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. It would have been exciting. It would have been easy to get caught up with the excitement and the fervor of first love. Ephesians were known for both their faith and their love. Paul, when he writes to them, writes repeatedly about their faith and love for Christ, for God, and for each other. But that wasn't all that long after he had left.
they had lost that first love. Which would have possibly come as a chalk to the people reading the letter initially. But we're doing all these things. We're doing all this for God. But you have lost your first love. Which leads us to 1 Corinthians 13, love. So famously read at weddings, and I don't know why. <clears throat> Verse 1, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is important. God has said, I am love. Jesus commanded us to love each other. Lack of love was a horrible condemnation on this church. That it was so bad, God said, if you don't repent, if you don't change, I'm going to remove your lampstand. I'm going to remove you as a church. No other church in these series of letters gets this bleak assessment. No other church is told so blankly, if you don't shape up, I'm just going to let you fall apart. That all of the good work all of the Bible teaching was pointless without love. <clears throat> and a lack of love probably points to a lack of evangelism. If you don't love others, there's probably less urgent need to spread the gospel. If you don't love others, you probably aren't going to put a lot of effort into it. God said, I will snuff out your lampstand. He may have let them do it themselves. Let them die out. So the message was, remember, repent, and repeat your first works. Remember your first love. Reflect back on how you acted when you were first a Christian. Remember that excitement and desire to seek God and serve God. Reflect on how far you've drifted. And repent. change. Feel God's own grief about our situation. And feel God's own hatred for our sin. And change. And Paul in 2 Corinthians writes to them about that very point of the sin in the church in Corinth. And he says, Repent. Feel God's own grief of your sin. Feel that in yourselves. Use that to fuel your change. But as I said, it always ends with a promise. To the conqueror or overcomer. As John also wrote in 1 John chapter 5, 
for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? We overcome, not through our own strength. We overcome because we have accepted faith in Jesus. He has overcome the world. And we just accept that position in him. Our reward is and will be eternal life because we have overcome. But we need to work on our lives here. We need to take heed of the warning that Satan used the church's own strengths to tie it up in its own church activities rather than loving God and loving others. <clears throat> Good works can distract us. We can get so busy we lose time to do things for ourselves for God and pray and read the Bible. Knowing the truth can lead to harsh treatment of those who are not following the truth. The truth sets us free, it doesn't condemn, it points, it convicts, it doesn't condemn. What were the results? Well, Ignatius of Antioch, about 20, 20, 10 or 20 years after Revelation was written, commends the Ephesians for their faith and love. They may have accepted that message. They may have changed. The church did last. It changed. There were problems with that church. There were the councils of Ephesus, some of which some churches seem not to want to admit ever existed. <laughs> so in the year 190, they established that we should celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it should be done at the Passover when this actually happened as a good reminder and comm commemoration of his life, death, and resurrection. <laughs> the church then changed that organized churches then decided, oh, Sunday's a nice day for Easter, so let's just make it a Sunday near then. But they said it should be the actual Passover because that's when it happened and it's a good time to remember. It doesn't matter if you have to take a break during the week. 431. There was a vast meeting of churches at Ephesus. They declared that Jesus was both human and divine. They stood up for orthodox doctrine that Jesus was fully human and fully God. As I said, there were problems in that church. They also provided at that time justification for the current cult of Mary, which is a problem. <clears throat> not that long afterwards, dates I'm not sure about because I've seen both dates, <clears throat> they then flipped back and said, no, 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 no. Jesus was only God. Forget this human bit. So by the mid-late 5th century, they had walked away from truth and doctrine, despite the fact that only 20 or 50 years previously, they had been upholding truth and doctrine. So take heed. Hear God's message. It is for all of us that we can all fall away. The church's Ephesus was known for its works, its faith, and its love, and no longer exists. We need to accept meekly God's message and ensure we do works in love and maintain our faith through our love for Jesus.